Robert Louis Stevenson, Jules Verne, Francis Hodgson Burnett, Mark Twain, James Fenimore Cooper, and the traditional tales of King Arthur and Robin Hood. For more than a hundred years, those classic authors and works, as well as many others like them, were part of a literary tradition that most children in the U.S. were exposed to at home or in school. Characters such as Jack Hawkins, Natty Bumpo, Sarah Crewe, Captain Nemo, Tom Sawyer, the Darling Siblings, and Robinson Crusoe were part of a shared vocabulary and set of cultural touchstones that spanned multiple generations of readers. However, many of those authors and characters are far less recognizable today to kids and younger adults who came of age in the past 25 years or so. I think of it as the Harry Potter effect, in reference to the crowding out of older children's books that occurred in library schools and bookstores following J.K. Rowling's phenomenal achievement and the flood of authors who attempted to replicate her recipe for success. In this video, I want to highlight some of the classics of yesteryear, particularly those from the late 1800s and early 1900s, when new printing technologies and a proliferation of exceedingly talented artists combined to create some of the most beautiful books ever printed. The Scribner Illustrated Classic series, first published by the Charles Scribner Sons Company over a period of more than 30 years, was perhaps the greatest collection of illustrated editions of those once well-known works. This is the story of the Scribner's classics. Welcome to the Library Ladder. At the start of the 20th century, Charles Scribner Sons was one of the preeminent American publishing companies, counting among its published authors such luminaries as Edith Wharton, Henry James, Jules Verne, and Teddy Roosevelt. The company published Scribner's Magazine, a highly regarded monthly literary and human interest periodical that was the first of its kind to begin publishing in color. The new color printing capabilities attracted the services of several of the most renowned artists and painters of that era, including Howard Pyle, Maxfield Parrish, and Frederick Remington. The company was also among the most successful publishers of children's literature at the time. Its St. Nicholas magazine was the leading children's magazine in the country, and its top two editors, Mary Mapes Dodge and Frank R. Stockton, were themselves successful authors. Other children's authors featured prominently by Scribner's included Louisa May Alcott, Mark Twain, Francis Hodgson Burnett, J.M. Barry, Ernest Thompson Seton, and Dan Beard. The Scribner Illustrated Classic series of books, which is generally credited to have begun in 1911 with Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, is difficult to quantify. This is partly because Scribner's definition of what constitutes a classic seems to have evolved over time and also because the company published other illustrated children's books alongside its classic series that were sometimes inconsistently identified as part of the series in its marketing materials. My best accounting of the original illustrated classic series indicates a total of 37 titles published between 1911 and 1947, and at least another 20 titles published during the same period that have a connection to the classic series even if they might not officially be part of it. The origins of the series go back to the late 1800s and early 1900s, when a surge of reader interest in traditional folklore, fairy tales, mythology, and nursery rhymes prompted publishers in the U.S. and the U.K. to produce beautifully illustrated volumes authored or edited by the likes of Andrew Lang, Hans Christian Andersen, Washington Irving, and Mother Goose. Many children's books at that time contained black and white pen and ink drawings, but only a very few offered glossy pages with full color illustrations, and those tended to be relatively expensive gift editions, owing to the scarcity and expense of the new printing equipment needed to reproduce color images. Scribner's was one of the first publishers to dip its toe into children's books with full color illustrations, which it did with two famous volumes of nursery rhymes, Eugene Field's Poems of Childhood in 1904, and Robert Louis Stevenson's A Child's Garden of Verses in 1905. Those two books featured artwork by two of the most highly regarded artists of the golden age of book illustration, Maxfield Parrish and Jesse Wilcox Smith. Parrish's artwork is instantly recognizable for its vibrant colors, dreamlike appearance, and three-dimensional qualities. 
while Smith is best known for her adorable and intimate portrayals of children and domestic life. She is considered by many art critics to be the greatest illustrator of children of all time. Scribner's then turned to Frank R. Stockton, the assistant editor of its St. Nicholas magazine for children, for a collection of fantasy stories titled The Queen's Museum and Other Fanciful Tales, published in 1906. If Stockton's name sounds familiar, you might have read his best-known work, the short story The Lady or the Tiger, while in high school or college. The Queen's Museum was illustrated by Frederick Richardson, an American artist best known for illustrating some of L. Frank Baum's other children's books unrelated to the Land of Oz, as well as several volumes of fairy tales. 1909 saw the publication of The Arabian Nights, adapted by Kate Douglas Wiggin, who is best known as the author of the classic Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. For this volume, Scribner's returned to Maxfield Parish, who produced some stunning masterpieces for it. Initially, these four books weren't considered part of the Illustrated Classic series, despite sharing similarities in book design and layout. By the 1920s, though, after Scribner's had firmly established the Illustrated Classics brand with other titles in the series, the four books were officially added to the list. After the success of The Arabian Nights, Scribner's decided to venture beyond folk tales, poems, and short stories, and to take a chance on illustrating a full-length novel in color. The novel they chose was one of the most popular adventure stories of the preceding 30 years, Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. And to illustrate it, they invited an up-and-coming former student of Howard Pyle, N.C. Wyeth, who was making a name for himself illustrating articles and stories for the Saturday Evening Post and the Harper's and Scribner's monthly magazines. It was a decision that would change publishing and art history. Published in 1911, Treasure Island, featuring 17 paintings by Wyeth, was a sensation. It was enormously successful. For the first time, one of the most popular books of the era had vibrant, lifelike illustrations to fuel the imaginations of readers. His paintings and those of his former teacher, Pyle, are iconic and inspired countless authors, illustrators, and eventually filmmakers in their future depictions of pirates. The mental image you get when you think of a pirate is probably in large part a product of Wyeth's imagination. Treasure Island's success vaulted Wyeth into the top echelon of in-demand illustrators. Recognizing an enormous market opportunity, Scribner's quickly decided to fast-track additional illustrated novels, most of which, for the next decade, were adventure stories in the vein of Treasure Island. Wanting to replicate their earlier success, they turned to Wyeth again, this time to illustrate another popular work by Stevenson, Kidnapped, the first book in the adventures of David Balfour. This illustrated edition was published in 1913 and prompted the launch of the Scribner Illustrated Classics brand. Now that Scribner's was convinced it wanted a regular series of high-quality illustrated books for children. Although not quite as successful as Treasure Island, Kidnapped was still a triumph that reinforced the company's commitment to the series and to Wyeth. For his part, Wyeth proceeded to illustrate nine of the next 15 books in the series over a period of 12 years. Then in total, he illustrated 16 books in the series before his death in 1945. Between 1913 and 1925, Wyeth produced amazing artwork for the adventure classics The Black Arrow, also by Robert Louis Stevenson, The Boy's King Arthur by Sidney Lanier, The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper, Westward Ho by Charles Kingsley, The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne, The Scottish Chiefs by Jane Porter, David Balfour by Robert Louis Stevenson, and The Deerslayer by James Fenimore Cooper. While the tales of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table are still commonly known and recognized today, and the 1990s saw popular films give new life to characters in some of the other books, Many of these novels are woefully overlooked these days. The Black Arrow, set during the Wars of the Roses in 15th century England, is my favorite Stevenson novel. It follows a young man's journey to knighthood as he rescues a fair damsel and seeks justice for his father's murder with help from a band of idealistic outlaws. While that might sound a lot like Robin Hood, this is a different tale. The other Stevenson novel, David Balfour, 
also titled Catriona, is the sequel to Kidnapped and continues the rousing adventures of the eponymous character in the Scottish Highlands. And speaking of Scotland, Jane Porter's The Scottish Chiefs, first published in 1810, tells a fascinating version of the story of William Wallace, Robert the Bruce, and the battle for Scottish independence from England. I suspect it's a more historically accurate account than the movie Braveheart. The Mysterious Island is another great story and is my favorite of Verne's books. It's a quasi-sequel to 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, despite having a timeline completely incompatible with that of the earlier book. It tells the story of a small group of prisoners of war during the U.S. Civil War who escape in a balloon during a storm that blows them far out to sea, where they crash land days later on an unknown and isolated island. It then becomes a survival tale where the characters contend with environmental hazards, marauding pirates, and a mystery buried at the heart of the island. It's also rather different from its film adaptations, such as the 1961 Ray Harryhausen extravaganza and the 2012 version starring The Rock. And the two books by Cooper track the exploits of the original Hawkeye, Nathaniel Bumpo, from his youth into adulthood on the colonial frontier, where he finds himself stuck between warring native tribes in the long-standing Algonquin and Iroquois conflict, and later between the French and the British in the Seven Years' War. As Mark Twain pointed out pithily in a famous essay, Cooper's writing style leaves a lot to be desired, but the stories he tells are classics for a reason, and well worth reading. Other adventure novels in the illustrated classic series that were published in the 1920s included Sir Walter Scott's Quentin Durward, illustrated by C. Bossorum Chambers, Edward Bulwer Lytton's The Last Days of Pompeii, illustrated by F. C. Yon, Captain Marriott's Children of the New Forest, illustrated by Stafford Good, who was a student of Wyeth's, and two more books by Jules Verne, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, illustrated by W.J. Aylward, and Michael Strogoff, illustrated by Wyeth. Scribner's also stretched its definition of classic by including the first modern work in the series, 1925's Drums, a U.S. Revolutionary War Saga, written by James Boyd and illustrated by Wyeth. I've enjoyed all of those novels to varying degrees, with my favorites being the last three, and my least favorite being the one by Bulwer Lytton, whose writing style can be a little tedious. He was, after all, the originator of the It Was a Dark and Stormy Night cliché. The Verne books are straightforward translations from French, with terrific illustrations. In particular, the illustrations by Aylward for 20,000 Leagues include some of my favorites in the entire series of Scribner's classics. Ironically, Aylward only got the commission after Wyeth turned it down, because he had difficulty imagining potential artwork for it. This is one instance where I'm glad Wyeth didn't illustrate a book. Michael Strogoff isn't one of Verne's best-known novels, but it's one of his best written, in my opinion. It's a pure adventure story about a Russian military courier who's sent on a dangerous mission across the Siberian steppes to warn the Tsarist government of an impending rebellion by Tartar tribes. As usual, Wyeth's artwork is exceptional and conveys a sense of vibrant urgency to the action. The final two adventure books in the Scribner series are adaptations by James Baldwin of the mythical tales of two classic heroes, 1930s The Story of Roland, about a legendary French military hero during the time of Charlemagne, and 1931's The Story of Siegfried, recounting parts of the Norse myths that inspired the Ring of the Nibelung. Both books were illustrated in brilliant color by Peter Hurd, who was a student of Wyeth's as well as his son-in-law. Clearly, Scribner's had tremendous respect for the talents of Wyeth and his students. Those 18 adventure novels for older children were the largest segment of the Scribner's illustrated classics, comprising nearly half of all the titles in the series, and were the ones primarily responsible for establishing its initial reputation and brand. However, Scribner's also published 13 volumes of traditional stories aimed at younger children. These included the four titles I mentioned earlier that predate Treasure Island and were eventually rebranded in the 1920s to become part of the illustrated classics series. 
They also included children's novels previously published by Scribner's with simple pen and ink illustrations, but now updated with glorious full-color artwork. There were Francis Hodgson Burnett's Little Lord Fauntleroy, illustrated by Reginald Birch, and A Little Princess, illustrated by Ethel Franklin Betts. Kenneth Graham's The Wind in the Willows, illustrated by Nancy Barnhart. Mary Mapes Dodge's Hans Brinker or The Silver Skates, illustrated by George Wharton Edwards. And J.M. Barry's Peter Pan and Wendy, illustrated by Mabel Lucy Atwell. Due to their artwork, these are some of the best editions of these books for readers of any age. A final classic children's novel is John Fox Jr.'s The Little Shepherd of Kingdom Come, illustrated by N.C. Wyeth. This is one of the few misfires in the series, in my opinion. It's the story of an orphan boy in Kentucky during the U.S. Civil War. It's not a bad novel, but its depictions of certain characters and life during that time period are very stereotyped and haven't aged well. Other traditional children's books included a 1920 collection of 38 fairy tales by the Brothers Grimm, gorgeously illustrated by Eleanor Abbott, that includes, among others, The Six Swans, The Two King's Children, The Soaring Lark, The Two Brothers, The Twelve Dancing Princesses, and The Nix in the Pond. There's a 1922 anthology titled Poems of American Patriotism, illustrated by Wyeth, that includes 69 poems by Longfellow, Whitman, Emerson, James Russell Lowell, and Oliver Wendell Holmes, among many others. And a 1947 anthology of fairy tales from around the world compiled by Alice Dalgleish, titled The Enchanted Book, with illustrations by Concetta Cacciola. The Enchanted Book was the final title in the original Illustrated Classics series. Scribner's also published six titles in the series between 1925 and 1942 that don't quite fit into the categories previously discussed. Three of the volumes are anthologies of adapted excerpts taken from the novels of Charles Dickens and Louisa May Alcott. They include 1925's The Children of Dickens, adapted by Samuel McCord Crothers and illustrated by Jesse Wilcox Smith that includes brief vignettes of more than 20 youthful Dickens characters such as Pip, David Copperfield, Oliver Twist, Little Nell, Jenny Wren, Tiny Tim, and the Dombey Children. There's also 1935's People from Dickens, written by Rachel Field and illustrated by Thomas Fogarty, that provides short summaries of the plots and snippets of key dialogue from eight Dickens novels, including A Tale of Two Cities, David Copperfield, Dombey and Son, and the old curiosity shop. And 1936's Louisa Alcott's People, arranged by Mae Lamberton Becker and again illustrated by Thomas Fogarty. This volume excerpts notable chapters from six of Alcott's novels, including Little Women, Little Men, Joe's Boys, Eight Cousins, and An Old Fashioned Girl. The other three volumes were modern heartwarmers that, due to their commercial and critical success at the time, were given the illustrated classics treatment within a couple of years of their initial publication. These included the 1927 Newbery Award-winning Smokey the Cow Horse, written and illustrated by Will James that, unsurprisingly, tells the story of a cowboy and his horse. There's 1930's Jingle Bob, a similarly themed story of cattle ranching in Wyoming in the late 1800s, written by Philip Ashton Rollins and illustrated by N.C. Wyeth. And 1939's The Yearling, the Pulitzer Prize-winning story of a boy and his pet fawn in rural Florida, written by Marjorie Kennan Rawlings and illustrated by N.C. Wyeth in his last work for Scribner's. These 37 books represent the core of the Scribner's Illustrated Classics series, However, Scribner's published several more illustrated books for children during the same period that sometimes are attributed to the illustrated classic series, even if they're not clearly a part of it. Most of these books were of different sizes and printing formats than those in the classic series. They include timeless works such as J.M. Barrie's Peter Pan in Kensington Gardens, the first appearance of Peter Pan in 1906 that was illustrated by Arthur Rackham as well as 1912's Christmas Tales and Christmas Verse, compiled by Eugene Field and illustrated by Florence Storer. 
and a 1922 collection of Bible stories adapted for children titled The Children's Bible. There was a coming-of-age tale in The Boy Immigrants by Noah Brooks, published in 1916 and illustrated by another student of Howard Pyle, Harvey Dunn and the 1932 autobiography of artist and author Will James titled Lone Cowboy that James also illustrated. Author Lewis Dodge contributed three titles, The Sandman's Forest from 1918, The Sandman's Mountain also from 1918, and Every Child from 1921. And Native American folklorist and advocate Frank Byrne Linderman authored three titles as well, Indian Y Stories in 1915, Indian Old Man Stories in 1920, and How It Came About Stories in 1921. The Knave of Hearts, a short fable from 1925 written by Louise Saunders, who also was the wife of legendary Scribner's editor-in-chief, Max Perkins, has been described at times as part of the Scribner's Illustrated Classic series because of its status as one of the very few books illustrated by renowned artist Maxfield Parrish. And there were three anthologies of short stories for children compiled by J.M. Barry's secretary and noted ghost story enthusiast, Cynthia Asquith, and illustrated by a variety of artists. 1925's The Flying Carpet, 1926's The Treasure Ship, and 1927's Sales of Gold. Those anthologies for children included works by noted authors Thomas Hardy, A.A. A. Mill, G.K. Chesterton, Hugh Lofting, J.M. Barry, P.G. Woodhouse, Algernon Blackwood, and John Buchan, among many others. Finally, in 1933, Scribner's published a five-volume commemorative edition of several of the best-known books authored and illustrated by Howard Pyle, including The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood and his four-book set of stories about King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. In my opinion, these books by Pyle have perhaps the greatest claim to be included in the Illustrated Classics series. They're traditional adventure stories in the vein of many others in the series. They were published in a size and format similar to that used by the Classics series. And they included additional color artwork and forewords written by five of Pyle's former students, including N.C. Wyeth, W.J. Aylward, Frank Schoonover, Harvey Dunn, and Stanley Arthurs. As I mentioned earlier, the Scribner's Illustrated Classic series was the greatest of the illustrated series of children's books various publishers produced in the first half of the 20th century. It was the largest and longest running series, staying in print throughout most of the last century. And it was also the most influential. After Scribner's early success with Treasure Island and Kidnapped, many other publishers, including Harper and Brothers, David McKay, Rand McNally, Hampton Publishing, and Don Mead began scouring their own back catalogs of authors and titles to find works they could turn into full-color illustrated editions. Some of the famous artists they turned to for their artwork included Mead Schaefer, Milo Winter, Frank Schoonover, and, of course, N.C. Wyeth. Together with the Scribner's Classics, these books constitute an incredible collection of classic literature, and not just because of their illustrations. They're practically a small library of classic books unto themselves. I also want to mention some recent developments. Starting in the 1990s, after Simon & Schuster acquired Scribner's, the company began reissuing many of the original titles in its illustrated classic series. And it also began adding more titles to the reissued series, including ones such as Robinson Crusoe and Robin Hood, illustrated by N.C. Wyeth, that were previously part of other publishers' series. Other new titles added to the series are Bambi, The Call of the Wild, White Fang, The Red Badge of Courage, and Watership Down. All of these I've discussed are worth reading and preserving, and I'm very glad Scribner's is keeping many of them in print. As I mentioned in my previous video, these books and others like them can serve as terrific gateway introductions to the broader range of older classics that might otherwise be daunting to interested readers. You might enjoy getting your feet wet with these titles before tackling Tolstoy or Proust. And as a note to collectors of the Scribner series, beginning in the late 1920s as a cost-saving measure, 
Scribner's reduced the number of color illustrations included in reprints of most titles. For example, the 1911 printing of Treasure Island contains 17 of Wyatt's paintings, but by 1933, the number was down to 12. Likewise, Eleanor Abbott produced 13 paintings for the 1920 printing of Grimm's Fairy Tales, but by the 1940s, only nine were included in the book. This makes early printings particularly collectible and enjoyable to read. I hope you've enjoyed this overview of the Scribner's Illustrated Classic series. I plan to feature other illustrated series in future videos. Do you have any favorite classics or illustrated editions that you'd recommend as entry points for readers? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching.